Uh, my name is Fred Damon. I'm in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Virginia and uh, a member of the Speakers Committee for both the uh, Southeast Asian Program and the East Asian Program. It's my pleasure to welcome you this evening to the Coughlin Lecture in Southeast Asia. Uh, this is, comes our way by the uh, uh, virtue of Richard Coughlin, who was a, a member of the University of Virginia Sociology and Anthropology Department from 1963 until he retired in 1987. Um, uh, Dick Coughlin, as I knew him, was a, quite an interesting character. Um, he was got into uh, Vietnam, excuse me, the World War II, which made him an expert in uh, Japan, he then got sent to Vietnam, and that was a track for him to become an expert in Southeast Asia. Uh, by the time he retired, he was a master in Japanese, Korean, French, Cantonese, and the Thai languages, and did a whole lot of stuff uh, inside the university and for people of Southeast Asian and Asian uh, interests and backgrounds. Um, after Jim's talk, we will have a, a, a panel for maybe 15 minutes, a response by our panelists, Deborah Lawrence and Manuel Lerdo from the Environmental Science Department, both of whom have experience in Southeast Asia. And then Sylvia Tiddy from the Department of Anthropology. Uh, Sylvia is also from Amsterdam, one of the places that's not quite our speaker's home, but pretty close to that. Uh, and then after maybe 15 minutes, we'll open it up for questions. Now, um, I could talk for an hour about our speaker, uh, uh, Professor James J. Fox. He has a Harvard BA, uh, then a, a diploma and a B.Lit and a D.Phil from Oxford. Uh, he is taught at Duke, Cornell, and then Harvard. And in 1975, maybe 76, he went to ANU, where he is technically still located, although he has also taught in dozens of universities around the uh, world and is currently uh, a member of uh, the department of, uh, or in the University of Indonesia, in Indonesia. He lectures in uh, Indonesia now and again, and he could be considered an expert on uh, Southeast Asian kinship, on East, um, Eastern Indonesian oral literature, uh, he spent years doing research on environmental issues. It's actually quite something. He's uh, written or edited dozens of books, uh, also dozens of articles, um, uh, and uh, you know it goes on and on. He's translated into English uh, papers and, and things from uh, the Dutch language, from French, and from Indonesian. Uh, most anthropologists will uh, know or know they should know about. Marcel Moses' Seasonal Variations. Jim is the person who translated that from French into English. It's a great honor to have him. Uh, again, I could go on and on, but I'm going to kind of leave it to you at this point, Jim. So ladies and gentlemen, and everyone else, perceptions from below the winds and beyond uh, reconsidering Southeast Asia within the Indo-Pacific. It's the floor is yours, Jim. All right, thank you. Fortunately, fortunately for me, I can't see myself on the screen. <laughs> so um, I shall be able to present this. And then once I've finished with the PowerPoint, try to bring myself back on screen, at least to see myself. When a senior academic is invited to give a prestigious lecture, it is generally expected that he should provide a prom promising synthesis of views arrived at over many decades. At best, all I can offer you here is some scaffolding, some of which I continue to reassemble. This presentation of some of my ideas, I confess, follows my own personal journey through the region of Southeast Asia. So let me begin by looking at how we tend to define Southeast Asia. Labels are important. They set boundaries and proclaim identities. Southeast Asia is one such regional label. Whether as a geographical description or as a cultural designation, Southeast Asia draws boundaries and proposes identities. 
while it is reasonably simple to place a boundary around the mainland Southeast Asia, it is less easy to do so for maritime Southeast Asia, where uh, I have focused my research. Much of this research has been on Indonesia, which, which is the core area of Southeast Asia, maritime Southeast Asia, what, the, what in Indonesia is known as Nusantara, the islands in between. When I shifted my research to the study of the Austronesian speaking populations and to the study of the, of the social and cultural consequences of the spread of these populations, I was forced to extend my focus <coughs> to the islands in between, but also Taiwan directly to the north of the Philippines, separated only by a narrow sea gap had to be included. My early research was in Eastern Indonesia for which there is no separation by sea, Oceania and the Pacific. In this research, I came to the conclusion that much of what I was analyzing had to be, had its cultural counterparts in Oceania. For me, Oceania begins in Eastern Indonesia and cannot be neatly excluded from Southeast Asia. By this same, same token, Focusing on the Austronesians who carried their language and culture to Madagascar, Madagascar deserves a place in this wider purview. A region is defined in time and space. Those scholars who define Southeast Asia as the historical region we recognize today drew their main perspectives from a few thousand years of recent history documenting the formative effects of the civilizations of China and India on Southeast Asia and the later equally transformative influences of Islam. Adopting a deeper time perspective, however, offers further understandings. The migrations of the Austronesian populations take us back 5,000 years, but this too is insufficient to encapsulate the whole of Southeast Asia's human history or its cultural identity. The Austronesians were latecomers to Southeast Asia and Oceania. The only area that they reached that had not previously been reached by other population were the, island, the further islands of Melanesia and the more distant Pacific. The Austronesian expansion has therefore to be situated in a history of cultural contact. The remarkable aspects of this expansion have to do with the predom predominant transmission of sim a similar set of culturally defined conceptions among speakers of related languages. The earliest wave of human settlement into Southeast Asia and Oceania, ones that were still only beginning to be deciphered, particularly with their Denisovian signatures, set the stage for later arrivals. Of these later migrations that can with some reliability be associated with specific linguistic groups, the first, the Austroasiatic speakers were Neolithic farmers who spread from China through mainland Southeast Asia and into the islands of Western Indonesia. Their spread preceded that of the Austronesians whose migrations were primarily a maritime dispersal with agricultural accompaniments. The other populations whom the Austronesians encountered in their expansion are all lumped together as non-Austronesian speakers, a designation without specificity. For more specificity, we can look to the present diversity of Papuan languages in Eastern Indonesia and Oceania. There are over 800 of these languages divided among 45 or more proposed language families. Austronesian speakers have encountered them, <coughs> encountered them and have been influenced in, <coughs> by varying degrees by many of them. This is a fundamental factor in understanding the processes of adaptation and assimilation that occurred during the Austronesian expansion. The earliest 
and most spectacular Austronesian thrust into the Pacific region has been a source of controversy for decades. And it has been one at the center of a con of debate at the ANU from the moment that I arrived until the present. To explain, in 1952, connecting sites of a distinct dentate stamp pottery found across Oceania from the Solomon Islands to, the, to Fiji and New, New Caledonia, Edward Gifford from the University of California gave conception to the idea of, quote, a Lapita population, named for the site he excavated in New Caledonia, a population who had left traces of its spread across the Pacific at a notably early period. Using what was then the new radiocarbon dating methods, Gifford was able to date the associated deposits at his Lapita site at 2,800 BP. This conception in turn spawned an academic debate about the origins of the population that continued for decades as more sites associated with Lapita style pottery were discovered. The debate has centered on where to locate the homeland of the Lupita populations. The question has been whether this homeland was to be found locally within Oceania, in particular in the Bismarck archipelago where, where Lupita pottery makes its first prominent appearance, or whether the original homeland of the Lupita populations had to be located further westward in the islands of Indonesia, in line with the rapid expansion of the Austronesian populations. A breakthrough came with the discovery of a Lapita cemetery at a site at Teo Uma on the coast of Efate in Vanuatu, where human remains were found that could be genetically identified and dating. This landmark genetic evidence established an Asiatic and more specifically an Austronesian origin of these Lapita people, now rena renamed as the first remote Oceanians, pointing to Taiwan, pointing to Taiwan and the Philippines as their likely source with little admixture of Papuan genes. The dating of these Te Uma remains was was determined at 3,000 to 2,500 BP, very similar to the dates uh, that Gifford had for his site. In the most basic of terms, the population, the, the Polynesians, particularly the Eastern Polynesians, are the closest existing population to those early Lapita Austronesians. While these discoveries decisively confirm the view of the Lapita peoples as an initial and distinct pulse of early Austronesian voyagers who had moved with relative rapidity through the islands of Oceania, leapfrogging some of them and moving out into the remote islands of the Polynesia. This also changed the nature of the investigation of Austronesian expansion into Oceania. Identifying the early impulse and distinguishing and distinguishing it from subsequent waves of migration into and through Oceania set the basis for a new research agenda, one that needed to differentiate among Austronesian populations, particularly those who had, in the course of their migration, been in contact with non-Austronesian populations and carried genetic and social signatures of this contact. When in 1989, I can convene the interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary Comparative Austronesian Project at the ANU, I came, became convinced that much of the comparative anthropological discussion on Austronesian societies was based on a few cases in different regions. Let me just move one more slide down. Here we go, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> but convinced that much of the compare, uh, that much of the comparative anthropological discussion on Austronesian societies was based on, on, on a few key cases in different regions, each of which offered partial perceptions, 
of the range and diversity of Austronesian societies. These key cases, however, provided no coherent consideration of the sweep of Austronesian social organization. Therefore, I set out to create a database that would provide a more comprehensive view by gathering the relationship terminologies for what I hoped would represent at least a quarter of the world's 2000 plus linguistically identifiable Austronesian societies. This database has grown beyond 400, it's now over 500 Austronesian terminologies. The aim has been to focus on regional social patterning across the whole of the Austronesian speaking world. Despite considerable lexical diversity, a clear patterning in these terminologies has emerged within regions and across regions. These distinct, distinctive patterns are relatively stable and encompass numerous societies. It is thus possible to categorize Austronesian societies according to the array of their patterns and to compare them one to another. With these insights, one can glimpse the outlines of a development history of Austronesian terminologies and the societies they represent, and where both formal patterning and lexical evidence combine, it is possible to discern distinct pathways of migration. From this comparative Austronesian perspective, one can evaluate the significance of the Lapita pulse into the Pacific. It was early and distinctive. The terminologies of Eastern Polynesia are significantly different from those of the rest of Oceania. They do indeed share many principal features uh, associated with the societies of Taiwan and the Philippines. They're bilateral, unlike virtually all Melanesian terminologies, and the lexical terms they rely on are close cognates of Taiwan and the Philippines. As a consequence, the two ends of the Austronesian world, Taiwan and Hawaii, resemble each other, but these terminologies reveal more than just this connection. They have a pattern of relative age that appears to be one of the first pattern transformations that occurs in Eastern Indonesia. At the same time, they have one particular pattern similar to one found in the Philippines, but whose lexical items are most closely related to those of the Solomon Islands. Hence, these Polynesian terminologies are indeed a mixed bag that suggests derivation from Taiwan and the Philippines, but mediated by migration with a period of settlement first in Eastern Indonesia and then in the Solomon Islands. By contrast, the terminologies of Melanesian societies have different Austronesian derivations, most of which can be traced to later transformations of Austronesian patterns in Eastern Indonesia. They are for the most part either lineal or partially lineal and have distinct patterns unlike those of Eastern Polynesia. With one exception, these patterns appear to have made their first appearance in the islands of the North Moluccan, uh, Moluccas or in Halmahera, and they are, then were carried into Oceania along the coast of New Guinea. The appearance of such terminologies in close proximity, proximity to New, New Guinea suggests the influence of contact with a variety of non-Austronesian populations. The critical point to be emphasized is that is just it is both the terminological patterns and the genetic influences among these later populations have their beginnings in Eastern Indonesia. Now I want to move from this excursion in deep into the Pacific um, from and therefore from Eastern in Austronesia to Western Austronesia. But in doing so, it's worth noting that in historical terms, the Eastern, Eastern Austronesia, particularly uh, Oceania, was the heartland of subsistence strategies based on the cultivation of regional, regional domesticates of the banana, yam, taro, and sugarcane for sweetener. By contrast, the subsistence in Western Austronesia was dependent on rice and millet. Interestingly, Eastern Indonesia as a transition zone featured all of these subsistence crops. On the island of Roti, where my research 
as concentrated, these crops are given iconic status in the rituals as a set of pairs. Rice and millet is one pair, yam and taro is another pair, and banana and sugar cane are the third pair. I now look at some of the geopolitics of the Austronesian, Western Austronesian region. The history of the Austronesians is one of migration and dispersal. In contrast to the Austronesian migrations into the Pacific, other migrations over lesser distances but of greater future significance involve the regional dispersal of Malayic speaking Austronesians in Western Austronesia. These Malayic speaking populations represent a distinct cluster of related peoples whose distribution both inland and along the coasts of Borneo, Sumatra, and the Malay Peninsula include uh, some ethnographically well-studied Austronesians. That is, for example, the Iban, the Minangkabau, and above all, the many varieties of the local Malay po populations that anthropologists have given attention to. In the, 17th, in the seventh century, a center emerged among the maritime Malays on a strategic river basin in the coastal waters of Sumatra, perhaps initially near the present day town of Palembang. This was a seemingly improbable beginning for the emergence of what is today the most widely spoken of Austronesian languages. The center became a trading state, one whose royalty embraced a form of Hindu Buddhism, known from scattered stone inscriptions in a form of Malay, old Malay, this kingdom of Sriwijaya became the major entrepot linking trade between two other major Austronesian speaking port centers, those of Champa on the central Vietnamese coast and those of Taroman Nagara on Java's Northwest coast. More importantly, Sriwijaya served as a staging point in the monsoonal, monsoonal transshipment via the Malacca Straits linking China and India. Most of our knowledge of this state of Sriwijaya comes from the accounts of Chinese pilgrims who studied there while waiting their passage on to India for further study of Buddhism. As a vehicle of communication, Malay played a fundamental role in the history of Southeast Asia. At the time when the use of Malay began to emerge, the Austronesian speaking maritime states of Southeast Asia had long undergone a process of Sanskritization and religious inspiration from India. The early and earliest inscriptions in Malay were written in an Indic, a Pallava script. However, as Malay spread, it became not just a lingua franca of maritime trade, it became a primary vehicle for the transmission of Islam. Hindu Buddhist kingdoms were succeeded by Islamic sultanates across the archipelago. This conversion process recounted and embellished in local origin narratives began on the veranda of Mecca at the furthest end of Sumatra and proceeded eastward along the coast of Sumatra and Java. The use of Malay was particularly crucial as Islam spread into Eastern Indonesia and to the new trading centers in the Moluccas. Although the impetus for the conversion of the rulers of the islands of Ternata and Tidor may have come via Java, both island sultanates together, both island sultans that can control the trade in cloves had populations who spoke non-Austronesian languages. Yet, they both uh, Ternata and Tidora adopted Malay as their trade language. The same pattern occurred in other areas of Eastern Indonesia. The conversion of the rulers of the joint kingdom of Goa Talo in South Sulawesi, the port town of Makassar, is attributed to three legendary ulama from the Malay world. This was followed by a similar conversion of the ruler of Bima on Sumbawa, whose sultanate adopted Malay as the vehicle of its legal and courtly traditions. 
Of significance too, is one of the earliest surviving Malay manuscripts, the mid 17th century Hikaya Tanahitu, that narrates the foundation of the domain of Hitu on the island of Ambon, the coming of Islam and the Muslim struggle against Dutch invaders. On their arrival in the East, the Portuguese recognized the importance of Malay and relied on this language for their purposes. One single incident is particularly telling. Ferdinand Magellan, who took part in Alfonso de Albuquerque's conquest of Malacca uh, in 1511, brought back with him to Portugal, a young Malay servant said to have originated in Sumatra. Magellan named this young man Enrique. Later, in 1519, when under Spanish flag, Magellan embarked on his voyage of global circumambulation, he insisted on retaining Enrique among his crew. On the 17th of March, 1521, having crossed the Pacific, Magellan anchored in the Gulf of Lete in the Philippines and directed Enrique to speak to the men in a boat that approached his ship. As momentously recorded by Antonio Pegafeta, the chronicler of the voyage, quote, Enrique spoke and they understood at once. By this simple act of communication, Magellan knew he was on the verge of reaching his destination. He had returned to the Malay speaking world that 10 years ago he had left in 1511. Even after the Portuguese had been pushed out by the Dutch from their ports in Western uh, Indonesia, Portuguese traders remained in Eastern Indonesia and continued to rely on Malay in their dealings. Notably among these remnant traders were the so-called Topazan or black Portuguese, a mestizo population based at Larantuka and East Flores and at Lifau on Timor's North coast. They gathered these Topazan black Portuguese gathered sandalwood from Timor for transshipment through Makassar to China. The British buccaneer William Dampier visited Lifau in 1699 and described this mixed multi-language Topaz community. And I quote, they seem in words to acknowledge the King of Portugal for their sovereign, yet they will not accept any officers sent by him. They speak indifferently the Malayan and their own languages as well as Portuguese. Decades before Dampier, in 1626, the Swiss Protestant Captain L.A. Ripon, sailing on behalf of the Dutch East India Company, put into Kamanasa on the south coast of Timor to establish trade uh, in sandalwood with the so-called emperor of the island. This ruler, the Tetun, the Tetun, The Tetuan ritual head of a configuration of local polities welcomed Ripon, who remained at Kamanasa court while sandalwood was gathered for him. Ripon reports that the emperor at Kamanasa had a dozen wives, each in her own royal house, and that he spent much of his time visiting them in succession. He would dine and spend the night at a different house and would otherwise pass his time with a court of some 50 elegant nobles. During his time at court, Ripon regularly conversed with the ruler who spoke a form of Malay, which Ripon actually recorded in his diary. Thus, by the early 17th century, Malay was the trading language from Sumatra to the Moluccas and from Southern Philippines to the coast of Timor. The Dutch East India Company also promoted the use of Malay in all their dealings. They even institutionalized its use through the establishment of a position informally known as Tolk or interpreter, 
who became a key figure in the company's engagement with local populations, and especially with the rulers and headmen with whom the company had signed treaties of trade and, al and alliance. On small islands, unlike, unlike larger islands where, where substantial fortifications were deemed essential, the company appointed an interpreter to represent their local interests. During the company's period, there were hundreds of these lowly interpreters fluent in Malay, stationed on scattered islands in Eastern Indonesia. As salaried members of the company, they were visited at least twice each year, provided with supplies and expected to retain the loyalty of the local populations, particularly its rulers and, and, and nobles. All of them were allowed to engage in personal trade and many of them stationed for years on the same island adopted a native style of life. Many of these interpreters, especially in the 18th century, were non-Dutch mainly Germans or individuals of mixed European descent. When Captain James Cook visited the small island of Sabu in September, 1770, he encountered one such company interpreter named Johann Christoph Lange, who had been born in Saxony and who had already been resident on Sabu for 10 years. Cook describes him as, quote, distinguished from the natives only by his color and his dress, for he sits upon the ground, chews his beetle, and in every respect has adopted their character and manners. Another notable company interpreter was Ernst Christoph Bachewitz from Erfurt, who wrote a detailed and engaging biograph biographical account of his long stay on the island of Leti, that's on the very bottom of the map down here, if you can find it, in the southern Moluccas. Barskowitz lived in Lette from September 1714 to October 1720. For a long time, he considered staying on indefinitely before finally deciding to leave and return to Europe. The presence of a local of a local European whose function, whose function was to represent the company through the use of Malay, enhanced the prestige of, of, of the language. <clears throat> and, the case, and the case in point is the island of Roti, again, my field area. So here is the two, the, the field areas, and I'm talking about these different uh, kingdom, the different domains on the island, particularly Termanu, and then down on the south coast, the island, uh, the, the area of T. At the, at the time, at no time did the island of Roti merit a European functionary higher than an interpreter. The first of these interpreters was stationed on the island not long after the company signed its first treaty with several rulers on the island in six in 1662. In the case of Roti, however, the company went further than relying only on an interpreter. In 1677, the chief, the chief company officer in Kupan, on a visit to Roti, invited the then 15-year-old son of the recently deceased ruler of the domain of Termanu to join him on a pleasure trip. This trip was then strategically extended with the express purpose of giving him training and practice in Malay. This young Rotanese, identified as Pelokila in Rotanese genealogical narratives, eventually became the Lord or Monarch of Termano in, in 1685. And the company relied upon him as their key spokesman and liaison figure until he was succeeded by his brothers, his brother Sinlai Kila, who in fact took a very different tact and, and stance to the Dutch. The prestige of Malay also had a religious basis, especially in Eastern Indonesia. It became the vehicle not just for Islam, but for Christianity, whom the company especially when the company finally published Melchior Ledeker's translation of the Bible into Malay. 
There had been previous translations of the Bible, but Lydico's translation, in 17, finished in 1701, was a monumental achievement and one of the first complete translations of the Bible into any Asian language. Lydico's translation in the form of High Malay borrowed freely from both Arabic and Persian, hence the use of Allah uh, for God, which has been retained by Christians to the present. The Lydico translation of the Bible remained the standard translation standard translation for Protestant Christian community in the Netherlands Indies until 1916, and set a biblical standard for elevated speech among Christians, especially in Eastern Indonesia. Individual sporadic conversion to Christianity began early in Roti. A company register, a company dot book, a baptismal register for 1669, lists the baptisms of two Rotanis on its first page. A major change occurred, however, when the ruler of the domain of T and his entire family were baptized in 1729. Taking the name Benjamin, the ruler declared himself a Christian king in opposition to his rival, the pagan ruler of Tarmano. One of his first acts as a Christian king was to demand a Malay school. In the end, after various local machinations in 1735, the company assigned an Ambonese Christian, Hendrik Hendricks, to serve as Malay schoolmaster in tea. This set off a further rivalry among the rulers of the various domains of the island, each vying with the other to have his own local Malay language school. In the end, all of the domains, large and small, Christian or pagan, were able to obtain a local schoolmaster. However, by 1765, to reduce the substantial extractions that the company demanded for providing schoolmasters, a second generation of Malay-speaking Rotanese replaced their Ambonese teachers, and the Rotanese elite became self-educating Christians with schools that relied on Malay Bible as their principal vehicle of education. When the colonial government of the Netherlands Indies succeeded the Dutch East India Company, it confirmed and indeed entrenched the use of Malay as the language of its civil servants throughout the country. The future of Malay as the national language of Indonesia was however, guaranteed not by the Dutch, but by the Indonesian nationalists in their struggle for independence against Dutch colonialism. In Batavia on the 27th and 28th of October, a group of ardent young Indonesian nationalists established the future of Malay as Indonesia's national language in an oath that declared their commitment to one land, one nation, and one language. This, the Sumpa Pamuda, or the Youth's Oath, enshrined Malay as Bahasa Indonesia. From a language of a small coterie of boat people in the riverine swamps on the coast of Sumatra, Malay became by stages a language of trade and communication, a vehicle for the transmission of religion, a source of prestige and of literacy and of literary production, a means of education, of governance and of national aspiration and is today the national language of Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei, the official language of over 300 million people. Malay, especially in its Indonesian guise, certainly ranks as the most widely spoken Austronesian language. In Tagalog, as Filipino, would have to rank as the second most widely spoken Austronesian language. But neither is, is the language with the most first language speakers. That language is Javanese. When in 16, oh, when in 1963, Clifford Gertz published his influential study, Agricultural Involution, the Processes of e e e Ecological Change in Indonesia, he was describing a country and its agriculture and its agricultural environment was on the verge of a major transformation. 
He drew a contrast between a rice producing Java descending into ever increasing poverty and the Sweden based outer islands of Indonesia that appeared to have a different trajectory. This contrast drawn between Java and the outer islands of Indonesia was common to most commentators at the time. Within two years, in sep September 1965, Gay Tigapulu S occurred, an abortive uh, communist coup and a military takeover of the country. I arrived in Indonesia to begin my field work, my doctoral field work, in January 1965. And my wife and I lived on the island of Roti through the tumultuous months that altered the course of the nation. My career has seen the transformation of Indonesia the Gertz could not have foretold. I will focus on just two aspects of this transformation. The first of these is language. When Gertz did his fieldwork on Java, Javanese speakers were overwhelming the, overwhelmingly the largest ethno-linguistic group on Java. As a majority group, the Javanese were contrasted with all the other ethno-linguistic peoples in the outer islands of Indonesia. During the new order, under President Suharto, this contrast became muted and obliterated. A large scale trans, trans migration program was adopted with funding from the World Bank to transport and settle substantial numbers of Javanese to the outer islands, primarily Sumatra and Kalimantan. This was, in my view, an ill-conceived scheme purportedly intended to reduce the population of Java. What it did in effect was transfer young families who on Java would have expected to have two children to islands where they generally had four or more children thus increasing the overall population of Indonesia. The program also led to considerable, enormous land and forest clearing and a, and a change in the ecology of both Sumatra and Kalimantan. As it is now, Sumatra in fact is in, emitting more, more carbon than it, is, than, it is in, than it is sequestering. These changes were already evident in 1980, in the 1980 Indonesian National Census, which was the first census to record language speakers. According to the census, 43% of Indonesian households spoke Javanese at home on a daily basis. Of these 60 million, of these 60 million Javanese speakers, roughly 53 million were located on Java. Another 6 million were located on Sumatra. 62% of the population of Lampung were Javanese speakers, with 21% of the population of North Sumatra also Javanese speakers. More than a million more Javanese speakers were located on other outer islands with the largest concentration in Kalimantan. Thus, by 1980, the Javanese were the largest ethno-linguistic group outside of Java, as well as on Java. This, tra this trajectory has continued, and with increasing migration of populations from the outer islands to the large cities on Java, the percentage of Javanese speakers on Java has actually decreased, as the percentage outside of Java has increased. A similar and more spectacular transformation occurred in rice production, which Gertz argued was the cause of Javanese uh, poverty. In 1965, at the time when Indonesia, in Indonesia was the world's largest rice importing country, President Suharto launched a nationwide program of rice intensification known as PIMAS, which resulted in technical self-sufficiency in rice by 1985. The program obliterated the foundations of Gertz's analysis and changed the ecology of national rice production. At present, although Java remains a major producer of rice, it is no longer the majority producer, amounting for only 48% of national production. Sumatra's contribution to the production is 27%, while Sulawesi's contribution is 12%. 
major rice producing provinces are now to be found in South Sulawesi with a production of over 6 million tons, North and South Sumatra, both with over 5 million tons and Lampung with over 4.5 million tons. The Java outer island contrast that was central to Gertz's argument no longer holds. Now, in conclusion, when I convened the Comparative Austronesian uh, project at the ANU, the idea was to ex explore all aspects of the spread of the Austronesian into Southeast Asia. These explorations resulted in a considerable number of publications. Notably among these publications were eight volumes of the Comparative Austronesian series published and free for download from the ANU Press. Apart from the general and now outdated Austronesians volume, each of these collections has focused on an exploration of particular themes or on a theme or themes, on ideas of origin and ancestry on the Austronesian house as a physical site and as an organizing social idea, on the ideas of on the idea of precedence, ideas of social and ritual space, and the organization of communities in relation to the lands they inhabit on Austronesian ideas of thought and emotion and ideas of paths and journeys among Austronesian speaking populations. This lecture, like an Austronesian journey, has been an exploration of various facets of my research over the years, all linked to and focused on the Austronesians and the consequence of their dispersal. Rather than end on this note, I would like to conclude this Conklin lecture provocatively, if I may, by arguing that the Austronesians provided the Europeans with the technology they needed to embark on their explorations and find their way eventually to the Austronesian speaking world. The distinctive technology that propelled the Austronesians across half the world's oceans consisted of sewn vessel construction, the outrigger, and the mounted triangular sail. The triangular sail provided stability, uh, the, the outrigger provided stability, and the triangular sail, the windsurfer sail, <clears throat> provided flexibility and the ability to tack against the wind. Hundreds of variations of this technology can be seen on Austronesian sailing vessels from Hawaii to Madagascar. Austronesians began sailing into the Indian Ocean in, in, in their expansion, began early expanding into the Indian Ocean. And by the, 17th century, by the 7th century, Austronesians had crossed the Indian Ocean and were involved in oceanic trade. The distinct Austronesian sail influenced sailing techniques in the Western Indian Ocean and was and, and this technology was adapted by Arab sailors. In turn, Arabs transmitted their adaptation of a triangular sail to the Mediterranean world. This sail was then adapted and modified in the Latin world and then christened as the Latin sail. So the Portuguese, Spanish and Portuguese took credit for this, this remarkable sail. Portuguese added this Latin sail to their square rigged sailing vessels as an essential innovation that would carry them on their voyages down and around, around the coast of Africa in search of Asian spices. I want to conclude this Conklin lecture by quoting someone who qualifies to be called the first Austronesian the Italian noble Antonio Pigafetta, who chronicled Magellan's voyage and provided the first vocabulary list of an Austronesian language, that of the Malay spoken on the island of Pidora. He was also the first to recognize with some surprise the use of the triangular sail by Pacific Islanders. He writes as follows in his first encounter in, of his first encounter with Pacific Islanders. Their amusement, men and women, is to plow the seas with those small boats of theirs. These boats resemble fusilere, but they are, they are narrower. 
at the, si at the side opposite the sail. They have a large piece of wood pointed to at the top, with poles laid out at, across it and resting on the water in order that the boats sail more safely. The sail is made from palm leaves sewn together like a Latin sail. Those boats resemble dolphins which leap in the water from wave to wave. So with this dolphin's leap, I end this lecture. Thank you very much. You've, you've dropped a big pile on us, so I'm going to let our panelists go. Let me see if I can, I can Anybody stop. else who would like to? OK. OK. So panelists, you've got about 15 minutes. And I'm sorry. Sylvia, I apologize. Yes. Uh, I'm going to give you the pleasure of starting, Sylvia. All right. Thank you, Fred. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Fox, for this extensive and detailed and so well-connected talk. It's been a pleasure. I even forgot that I was pretending to be in, a, in an old academic lecture hall in Amsterdam. You uh, drew me in so much. So thank you so much for that. So um, one thing that I wanted to bring up for our panel um, has to do um, with um, the question of the query of place and also of the place of place. And here I'm trying to uh, tie this into a part of your title about reconsidering Southeast Asia within the Indo-Pacific. Um, and when I think about the question of the, question of the query of place, um, by which I mean thinking about uh, what makes, what defines, or what binds um, a region, whether this is Southeast Asia, Oceania, Austronesia. Um, this also makes me think about the place of place, whether this is in the discipline of anthropology, uh, whether this has this, uh, whether in connection with um, geopolitical dynamics, but also in institutions where things like area studies have been under siege for a long time, which I think uh, you at ANU have been um, well subjected to in many ways. So one thing that I um, admire in this talk and have admired about um, Professor Fox's work for quite some time is how um, expertly and attentively you attend to the question of place and the place of place of areas of area studies in your extensive body of work. Uh, like few others, I have to say, many others, but not quite at this level. I'm thinking, for example, of your very detailed analyses of uh, Rote and Sabu um, in the Eastern Indonesian province of what now is NDT, Nusa Tenggara Timur. Um, for example, um, as you describe in uh, Harvest of the Palm or in the essays that you um, edited for the flow of life, which I have here with me, um, much treasured book. But also, for example, in uh, the poetic power of place, which attends to, attends to a much larger area than uh, certain islands in Eastern Indonesia, um, namely Austronesia, or thinking, as you're uh, describing in your talk today, um, connected to Austronesians and their dispersal. Um, again, as you so beautifully discussed today. Now, your attention to place, but also your careful attention to making connections and making very well-researched arguments for how we can think of a certain place um, based on the dispersal of people, of their tools, of their technologies, like sales. What a wonderful example. And how ironically the use of sales in a way came back to haunt the original inventors of them. Um, this is a reason why um, over a decade ago, I in fact reached out to you when I was fresh off of my second round of um, field research as a young anthropologist or um, a PhD student in anthropology at the University of Amsterdam. And I was coming off of my uh, field work in Kupang, not too far from where you have conducted your field work, because I was so taken by your work uh, in Roti and Sabu. Uh, and what I encountered from the Ratonese and Sabunese um, in, in, in Kupang, where I did research in government offices, were mostly in the form of jokes. Uh, most civil servants of Timorese descent didn't really take um, to the Ratonese and the Sabunese, who um, were considered to be arrogant and uh, have far too many positions in civil service. And your work um, helped me make some sense of that. So you were kind enough back then to sponsor me to um, spend some time at ANU. Um, and there's no reason for you to remember this at all, because for me, this was far more memorable than it was for anybody else involved. But you uh, talked to me a lot about inter-ethnic joking about particular Rotanese joke over Australian flat whites and long blacks and what have you. 
Um, at the time in ANU, and this was around 2009, um, it seemed like um, your research center, and I might give it the wrong name, the Research Center for Asia and the Pacific, at least at that time, um, was undergoing some tumultuous times of its own. And the question of area studies, the future of area studies and its place within institutions was very much up in the air. And I think that is also the year um, when the research center faced some massive institutional changes uh, instigated by ANU. So this disagreement or this discussion or this uncertainty of the future of area studies and the place of the research center within ANU um, signaled um, the larger unstable position of place um, in various ways. And here I'm thinking of um, the decrease of importance of area studies when we think um, about this from a geopolitical um, perspective. So area studies were developed in the crucible of the Cold, World, uh, Cold, Cold War, but when that ended and globalization became the context of sort of thinking about contemporary history, area, area studies seemed to recede to the background in certain ways. In the discipline of anthropology, um, the discipline for, um, for atten attention to a uh, detailed attention to place and to space, things also changed. So Eastern Indonesia and also Austronesia um, have proven to be so important, for example, in structuralism, uh, structuralist theories, theory of marital exchange and symbolic classification, as you have worked with so extensively as well, um, made place for other kinds of research interests within the discipline. Uh, that seem to be more thematic and more place transcending, whether this has to do with inequality, environmentalism and sustainability, uh, governance, indigeneity and identity, which are all incredibly important and worthwhile attending to, yet seem to be more and more disengaged from, um, from detailed attention to a particular place, to an area. And also, um, the, this uncertainty reverberates institutionally. And here again, uh, it seems like your experiences at ANU have shown that, there, um, that area studies are in some ways under siege. And the longer I'm here at the University of Virginia, uh, the more uncertain the place of area studies seem to be here. So having said all of that and drawing on your long, long research experience, but also institutional experience, I wanted to ask you, once you have a chance to respond, um, to reflect on some of these trends and developments um, disciplinary, in a disciplinary and institutional way um, on this move away from place. Uh, what is the place of place within an institution such, such as a university or within a discipline such as anthropology? What is lost with a move away from place, from areas, um, if anything is lost at all? And what should we as uh, young-ish intellectuals and young-ish professors we're hoping to be in certain academic institutions for quite some time to come. What should we fight to keep and to hang on to? Well, um, that's almost another lecture. But what I'll say, what I well, let, let me let me just say that everything you say has occurred. Um, the ANU has been. Um, in my view, uh, radically transformed. Um, and perhaps um, in the process, we have lost a considerable expertise on our own region. Uh, we have gained, some would say, we have gained a greater expertise on, on, on the world. Uh, but um, we have lost that a uh, considerable expertise on uh, on the region. What I would say, I'm, there is something on YouTube, an interview that was done. A student interviewed me some time ago, and when I talked about how the ANU was set up, the the Research School of Pacific Studies, of which I was the last director, um, that has changed, but the the Research School of Pacific and Asian Studies was created, and it's very explicit, was not an area studies area. It was, it was a regional studies uh, thing. We looked at the region, but we did not consider ourselves an area studies institute. Uh, the College of Asia Pacific had a slightly different view on it. I mean, uh, they, uh, the, there was another uh, 
area that, that taught all different kinds of languages and had a more area uh, specific focus. We emphasized, and if you follow the whole history of our research school up until its, if its demise, um, was concentrating on disciplines. You were first and foremost, uh, 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 you had a discipline, and within that discipline, you had a focus on place. Okay. Now, as long as you had that discipline, um, you you qualified because of your discipline. You then brought your interest in place uh, with your discipline. And when you were hired, you you might work on New Guinea or you might work on on Indonesia. Um, had I decided that I would wanted to switch to the Philippines or had I switched to, I could have switched to Vietnam once I was appointed at the ANU. But there is the third element, and this is the element I've been trying to emphasize. The one requirement we had, almost without exception, is that no one could be appointed to the research school without a regional language. And everyone who was appointed was uh, expected to be fluent in at least one language. Um, if you were fluent in more than one language, all the better. So we did have, we did have discipline, we did have, uh, we had place, and we had language. And I think the, at its height, at its, at its zenith, uh, the Research School of Pacific and Asian Studies, uh, combining those three elements was what made it what it is. Um, we still hire people with some language, but it is not even mentioned in the prospectus anymore for most disciplines. Um, and I think the moment um, there is a very large trend, if you see, especially among undergraduates, for interest in international relations for which you need no language training. And uh, strategic and defense studies. Um, the, the increase, and this is maybe Australian, but the increase of, of interest among our students in strategic and defense um, um, is, um, is notable. Um, and, and we had our, our former prime minister, Paul Keating, two or three days ago was railing about this. He was old man's rant, but he was saying, here we are, we're, uh, we're, we've gone back to the old thing of, uh, of, of defending against Asia instead of defending with Asia. Um, and I think that was a very telling moment. There are changes in Australia. I'll stop there. The further I go, I could get into trouble. Yeah, Deborah or Manuel, you wanna pipe in from your perspectives? I'll speak a little. Um, I'll just say that I really enjoyed the talk so much. Um, I spent uh, a decade working in Kalimantan and um, mostly as an ecologist, as a wannabe anthropologist, but I wasn't one. And uh, I just loved it. And it's wonderful to hear about this place that is so much bigger than what I actually studied, which was just one little village outside a national park in West Kalimantan. Um, I am struck by this conversation about place or not place. And I'm thinking about as an ecologist, I, I feel like I relate to this conversation um, in that we, we wouldn't dream of doing ecology without attention to place, uh, place and history. Uh, we, just, we just couldn't do it. Um, a place defines the ecology. And yet we also look for um, things that transcend the one place that we study. We're, we're trying to find rules or um, truisms that apply to many places. So I'm, I'm sort of uh, ruining the day that you wouldn't study 
in anthropology in a same that you would not pay attention to the place. I know that I guess that's happening and I think that's interesting and um it's just it's just interesting because in, as an ecologist I can't imagine studying without attention to place. Uh, so with that just random probably bad deterministic environmental determinism kind of approach which is just what you get from an ecologist. I would like to ask the question why, this is just a total non sequitur, why is Australia not included in the picture? What's special about it that it did not get to be considered in that first picture, Professor Fox, you showed us of what Austronesia includes? Why okay, is it part of it? Fair, that's actually a very good question. But the, the remarkable thing, and, and actually I've, I, I've, I've written a lot about this. The Australia never had any permanent, permanent, I say, Austronesian settlement. Why? The Austronesians bypassed uh, Australia. Uh, my archaeologist, uh, uh, Ethel Anderson, an archaeologist, says that he has found traces of, uh, of a Marai on one of the islands, um, uh, in Norfolk, no, is it? Yes, Norfolk Island. He's found traces of it. So the Maori reached there, were there, but there are no Maori settlements there. Um, the, um, the first Indonesian, um, or first Austronesian, if you will, the first Austronesian uh, datable uh, contact with with Australia is by Bajau Laut. Uh, these are the sea gypsies who made their way down via eastern Indonesia to the offshore islands and then were blown off course and reached uh, Australia, finding it rich in Tripang or Bestemere. And having found that, they went back and established a trade that went on through the 19th century. It ended in 1906, which was a trade in, in so-called Tripang or um, Bestemere. But again, that never resulted. That, that, that was contact with the Aborigines, uh, but it never resulted in any Austronesian settlements. So unfortunately, Austronesia has, I mean, Australia has missed uh, being included in this Austronesian world. Can I just ask a quick follow-up? Anyone you want. Would you, would you consider that in Kalimantan, that they didn't really make it there either, that they only were on the edge? Do you think that like, do you count them in on the interior? Are they are they part of this? Everywhere, whole thing? everywhere in the interior, everywhere in the interior. Almost certainly, <coughs> if we look at it historically, almost certainly the Austroasiatic speakers were <coughs> were in Kalimantan before uh, the Austronesians, and it's almost certain that the many of the um, the peoples in central uh, Kalimantan uh, are assimilated Austronese, uh, Austroasiatic speakers, not speaking Austronesian speakers. But um, the if you, you name some groups, whichever you want to say, the, the, the Punan or the Penan or the Ngaju or whichever group in the interior you want to name are speaking perfectly good Austronesian languages. It's the Malays who have primarily uh, skirted, uh, been on the coast, rather than in the, well, no, that's, that's, that's wrong. The Iban penetrated in, there are Malayic speaking people. No, everywhere, everywhere in Kalimantan is, is full. It is, it is heartland Austronesian today. Thank you. Well, uh, let, let me start, first of all, by echoing Sylvia. That was really a, a magnificent talk. I really, I'm, I'm extremely happy, one, that I was here to see it, so to speak, live, and also that it's been recorded because I will be going back to it. Um, it was also, there was an element of what I call the, the Rashomon in the talk in that you had 
this audience of three each enjoyed it and took something very different from it as a major lesson. And I think that speaks to its strength as well. And for me, one of the really exciting points that you developed almost implicitly throughout the talk was the importance of time at much deeper scales than we typically consider. I am, I think, the only person on this Zoom screen without even one degree in anthropology. I think that was Deborah's undergraduate. Um, and so I come at it from a genetics background first and now, now as an ecologist, but I was really, I was very much struck by your beginning the talk really well before in historical terms, when at least I, in my rather naive state, typically think about the important events and the important happenings that have set the stage for what we see today. And this notion that we need to try, I mean, the notion that we need to understand the past to, to grok the present is, is somewhat, is pretty well accepted, but the idea that we need to go back on millennial scales is, is really, to me, pretty spectacular. And I think it has, in, in my field of ecology, forest dynamics, um, it resonates with findings over the last 30 years as well, that in fact, we cannot hope to understand the, the regulation of interactions among species the processes of communities without thinking about what was happening to them millennia ago. We, if we don't know that, we simply don't understand what we're seeing now. And you were painting a very similar portrait, it seemed to me, in there. And I guess, I guess my question for you now, going back to my time, um, I was in the same, the same location as Deborah a couple of years before her. Um, in the 1980s when I got there. Um, I guess my question for you is- Can I ask where? Where have you both been? Oh, oh this is in, in, in Gunung Palung, near Pontianak. Oh, near Pontianak, okay, good. Um, and and my, question, my question to you is, we were, so I, I got there in, in 1985. My question is very presentist in that sense. Um, really after, the main movements of transmigrasi. And yet still 1965 was a very vivid memory in that, in that region. We registered with every village we went to. And my question is to what extent have these movements, these short-term movements of people that were going on Java to Kalimantan outer islands to, that had occurred to Java and then further and then out. To what extent are those play, did those sort of feed into what emerged after 1998, after, when, when the government turned over finally? Where, how does that, that movement of people, how do you think that structured what came out in, in this century? Well, I, I think for every, every elder, well, let, let, let's, say, let's say for the majority of Indonesians living today, uh, the, the memory of Gay Tiga um, is still alive. Uh, it's very vivid uh, for some of us elders. There are fewer and fewer of us. Uh, but I, that's a one subject that I have, I've never written about. I lived through it. It was very traumatic. And um, I was, let's say, a near witness to many, many killings, even on the island of Roti. Okay, let's just put that psychologically, it's there. The aftermath is still being uh, played out. The aftermath is played out. I find one curious thing, I mean, it, I, to me, it's still not fully explained. 
But uh, for example, in Kalimantan, I don't know if you were aware of it, but there was not too many years ago, um, a, an outbreak of killings of Madaris in Kalimantan, uh, maybe somewhere near where you were working, I don't know. There was killings of Madaris. And the curious thing about that, and one I don't understand, is the Javanese who were settled you know, around there were not victims. What it seems to me, and, and this is purely speculative, um, and I see it in several places, the Javanese were adapting to local patterns more easily or more firmly, when I'm maybe, maybe wrong, than, than some of the Madaris were. Um, that's part of the things. But what I would emphasize is that for many of the trans migrants, um, whether in Kalimantan or Sumatra, um, the transition has been made. They're settling in. But they're settling in bringing also their technologies and their changes. And this is part of a, this vast trans, transformation that's occurring at the ground roots of uh, the mingling of, of populations, especially in Sumatra and Kalimantan. It's a, it's a fascinating area for the mixing and adaptation of systems. If you study it just from a point of view of, of systems, um, there have been several studies. I know one of the one of my students, Indonesian students, has written about how the Javanese adapted to swamp uh, rice cultivation, and in a matter of a generation or so, we're also competing with um, you know the the people of Banjarmasin in the ability to grow swamp um, uh, rice. So it's. Let, let me just make the point is that Indonesia is an extraordinary kaleidoscope of things to study. And the transformations that are going on right now are interesting and as significant as some of the transformations that occurred you know, thousands of years ago. But uh, they're turning, I would say, at a much faster rate. Um, and I've been the last few years since my retirement, I've been working only on uh, forest fires in Kalimantan and Sumatra and, and on peat fires. And that is an enormous, enormous problem. I mentioned just in passing in my lecture that Sumatra and I would begin to suspect maybe even Kalimantan is now uh, emitting more uh, carbon carbon dioxide than it is sequestering, uh, given the extent of the fire, certainly the fire of 2015 was enormous. That was a million gigabytes of carbon. Um, that puts it in a class with China um, in, in, in just a matter of a few months. I'm not talking about a year, but I'm just talking those fires are four months and that emissions uh, they were the biggest emitter in the world during those fires. So I'll just leave it there. There's too much to be talked about there. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Use the question and answer thing, or maybe see if you can hit, uh, put yourself on the mic and ask something. We're going to wait for a second, but I have one, Jim. Um, oh. You gave us um, uh, a, a fairly astonishing overview of almost two thirds of the globe by space. Um, you've also spent a large portion of your professional life doing policy things and interacting with various levels of Indonesian um, politicians and bureaucrats. How do you bring your um, academic intellectual life into that domain of action? 
Um, to be honest, to be honest, I have kept them separate. I've learned uh, working on projects uh, in Indonesia that would you say be policy uh, were are, um, are uh, things that I've learned a lot, enormous. In fact, I could someday I was thinking I'll never write it, but I was thinking of writing a um, a study of the bureaucracy of Jakarta, the, the, the whole complex bureaucracy that goes on within Jakarta. It's, it's really deserving of a proper anthropological or many proper anthropological studies. Uh, but I've kept it separate. One of the reasons, and, and this is, I have to say, um, essential, when you take on work uh, for a particular government agency, for example, um, oftentimes you're required to, uh, it requires con a confidentiality, and I've always respected that. Um, and um, I have, I don't think I have ever written a paper about how you do policy because I don't know how you do, I, I don't know how to tell people to do policy. I simply do whatever is required in a particular uh, assignment, but I, have, I don't know any rules for doing policy. And so most of the things now that are available, I mean, there are a lot of my, my, my reports are available. Uh, they are no longer, uh, confidential, but they're there. They're all specific and probably all dated. But that's, that's, I, they've had to be, you have to keep them somewhat separate. And I've never taught at ANU, I've never taught a course on, on how to do development, because I don't know how. Okay. Uh, we have a question, probably from an acquaintance of yours, uh, DDS Adhuri. Yes, yes. Yes, dear, I don't know, can you see the question? Yes. Okay, I'm going to read it. Uh, dear Pat Jim, would you tell us more on the position of the Oran Baju, sea nomad, in the Austronesian connections? Thank you, Didi. Okay, the the great picture. Um, Dedi is is one of my uh, former students, and we are we've written papers together, and we continue to exchange information. I would say at the moment on a daily basis. So, the Bajo are particularly interesting as an Austronesian population, and now I'm talking Austronesian because their language and culture is something that belongs in the Southern Philippines. Um, they are most closely related uh, culturally and linguistically to populations that you would find in the South, in the Southern Philippines. Because they have been sea nomads, they now are found um, from Sulawesi and from the from North Borneo to Sulawesi, to the Moluccas, uh, to Roti, and they also pioneered the way down to Australia. So they are a people of they as they define themselves. They are the people of the sea. They don't have one place, and they don't have uh, they have settlements everywhere. If you do a genealogy, as I try to do a genealogy, they only recite where they've lived. So they may, if you contact a, a Bajo, he'll tell you where he was born. And then he will tell you what at age five, he was here at age nine, he was there at age 10, he was over here. And he'll take you all across Indonesia. Okay, that's the Bajo. But as an Austronesian people, they have um, covered probably the widest extent of any, any, popul any Austronesian population and retained their identity. And they retained their identity by constantly shuffling among all sorts of different settlements. 
which makes them um, an extraordinarily interesting population to study. And I would say many of their social patterns, their social patterns are what one would identify as those patterns that carried the Austronesians originally out into the Pacific. But that that's getting more con controversial. But I think they they have they have they have this uh, unusual cognatic flexible social organization. They live on boats and they keep moving. Uh, Enough. Yeah, I think so. Anything else? I don't. Can you see another one? I don't see another one, no. Let me just see here, is something in the chat box? Okay. I have a question. Yep. Uh, maybe everyone wants to go to bed, but I do have one question. Uh, Professor Fox, you started us out talking about Neolithic origins. Mm -hmm. And it, that's what, what, are we talking about 12,000 years ago? 20,000 years ago, what 12,000, 10,000? All right, the, I had one slide and I had one mention on it. Yeah. If you know the work of the famous archeologist, my close colleague, Peter Bellwood. I don't. He has argued, he has argued as other archeologists that the impetus for migrations have, of people's migrations, not just the Austronesians, have been um, because of the, the spread of agriculture. And he has applied that hypothesis uh, to the Austronesians. Um, I, that's why I had that passing mention because okay. I don't think I don't think it fits. Huh. I said they were I, they were maritime. They were maritime, they were maritime, they were horticulturalists. Um, they had agricultural um, accompaniments. But what's interesting is this at two ends of the Austronesian world. At the, the, in my reading of the Neolithic, um, a lot of rice, and the rice was brought down into Indonesia, probably by the Austroasiatic peoples, well before the Austronesians. The Austronesians, some of the Austronesians may have been cultivating uh, rice and millet, but they may just as well have learned some of those techniques en route uh, through Western Austronesia. In Eastern Austronesia, and this dovetails with the work of uh, another famous archeologist here at the ANU, uh, Jack Golson, who has studied the domestication of different plants uh, in New Guinea. And certainly what was happening in the New Guinea region, the New Guinea region was not, um, was a source of the origin of different plants. And those plants were banana, uh, banana taro, different kinds of yams, and uh, throw in there, as I said, uh, sugar cane. Those were domesticates that are more likely to found in the greater New Guinea region. Um, uh, whereas rice, we know, was coming out of uh, southern China. Millet was coming from northern China. And they each have different pathways. Well, I wanted to suggest um, something that goes along with your, your sales which was, I was trying to get a handle on the timing because sea level was rising. And I'm just mm. thinking all your sailors needed more water. <laughs> and yeah. by, by, by 12,000 years ago, I'm trying to think like had the seas, like how much had they changed the landscape to make the travel better? Just, I just was sort of wondering about that. Well, uh depending on how far back you go, if you go back 50,000 years, um, 40,000 years, 50,000 years, there's almost a land bridge yeah. from, from mainland down to Australia. 
And what we see over a period of about 50,000 years is the sinking of that land bridge. Um, and um, the greater need during that period, huh, from 50,000 onward, for better sea transport. And the Austronesians had certainly mastered, huh, they'd, gone, uh, they'd gone from uh, rafts to very complicated uh, technologies uh, for the time, and certainly to this time, it's a very sophisticated uh, technology, what they have. Well, the last glacial maximum was 20,000 years ago. And from then yeah. on, it was a rising sea. So yep, yep, just interesting yep, yep. timing. Yep, yep. And I think you have to read that in to the whole history of the Austronesians. Cool. We have another question here. Uh, thank you. For, this is from uh, Peng Xinyan, uh, a former student of ours who is in Shandong uh, in China. Thank you, Professor Fox, for your talk. My question follows from Professor Tidi's comment uh, uh, where you were intending to, and how would you change the unit of analysis in our discipline of anthropology, given what you've talked about in this lecture? So what's the unit of analysis? Well, I'm very old fashioned. And that's why I shouldn't be advising graduate students anymore. But I would still insist the most important thing for an anthropologist is fieldwork. It doesn't actually matter what your fieldwork is, though I think, um, let, me, let, me, let me make it personal. Um, I did not choose to study roti. Uh, that was chosen for me uh, by my professor at Oxford. And I should add the Dutch connection. Uh, professor Jasselin de Jong was visiting Oxford and I was invited to an evening soiree at Professor Needham's house. And Professor Needham introduced me as his student to Professor Jasselin de Jong, the first time I met him. And he said, I'm sending this student to Roti. Okay, that's it. I had to go home. I had to go home, find an atlas, and find out where I was doing my field work. So, but you couldn't have, now Needham had chosen, I now understood why he was chosen. He had strange ideas um, and they were wrong. And he was very disappointed because I wrote to him my first letter from the field, I was able to dissuade him that his theory was wrong. And he, uh, he wrote off, he found not, there was nothing interesting about Roti. Now I found Roti a very interesting subject. I, I consider myself fortunate, fortunate to be with having done field work on the island of Roti, very fortunate indeed. The Rotanese consider themselves the, um, they have golden brains and they are the smartest people on earth. And I was very pleased to have lived with the smartest people on earth. That's their view of themselves. Uh, and it's, it's I, I think Sylvia would admit they, they do say that. Um, and it was challenging. Which is why the rest uh, called them but I learned Sombong a lot. or sorry? arrogant. Oh, I'm sorry, what? which is why, um, Others call them sombong or arrogant. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly, because they do think themselves the smartest people on earth. Huh? And they've told me again and again. So, and I put in my thesis, I put in my thesis that, um, I put in my thesis that I thought uh, an evening spent with the Rotanese was as challenging as an evening at high table in Oxford. And Needham made me cut that out. That was unthinkable. So um, anyway, I was fortunate to have found that people, but they're as obscure and tiny an island as you can find in, in, in Indonesia. Um, so my, a unit of analysis, it doesn't, it doesn't matter so much as long as you are embedded, deeply embedded in field work. And from that field work, you then begin to build your uh, build up your expertise and understanding. 
but fieldwork is the defining feature for anthropology. 